Ingalls, Director of the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute here at Brock University. And thank you for joining us today for uh, Covey's Lecture Series presentation. This afternoon, we're excited to welcome Dr. Sud Pujari, a Covey Principal Scientist in Virology and Adjunct Professor of Biological Sciences here at Brock University. Sid received his PhD in plant pathology from Washington State University. Prior to joining Covey, he completed his NSERC postdoctoral fellowship at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in uh, Summerland in the beautiful Okanagan in uh, British Columbia. Currently at Covey, Sid leads multiple research projects focused on grapevine virus epidemiology, advanced molecular diagnostics, and disease management aspects. So please join me in welcoming Sid this afternoon for his presentation. Thank you, Debbie. Whenever I hear that long uh, <coughs> introduction, I feel like I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's nice to be here at the uh, Kavi Lecture Series as always, and uh, uh, always nice to see the sunlight and present. It always gives me a pleasure. So today we're going to talk about the, the importance of clean plant programs in grapevines. Uh, I know I put only for grapevines uh, as, as a focus crop here, but uh, today I'll be touching a little bit beyond grapevines to just give you uh, the audience an understanding of uh, how these clean plant programs have been developed elsewhere, if not here in Canada. So let me start by saying that the clean plant programs are very essential to the success and sustainability of any crop industry, especially grape and wine sector what we have here. As we have seen uh, through the Kavi Lecture Series, uh, we started with Dr. Jose Ramon, who spoke about uh, grapevine trunk diseases, and then we have Kevin Kerr uh, here uh, talking about uh, the dynamic changes that we have seen in the integrated pest management diseases, uh, not just focused on grapes and different uh, pests and pathogens, how uh, they have been emerged uh, and how the industry has been tackling here in Ontario as well as in other grape growing regions in Canada. So with all these things, we know that, you know, and, and also to emphasize the fact that the, um, Wendy McFadden Smith, as part of this Covey lecture series, will be speaking on, you know, virus diseases and their incidents, uh, I think on March, March uh, 28. Um, so what all these things brings to us is how susceptible these grapevines are for the pests and pathogens. Um, <clears throat> although there it is susceptible, we need to see when you are developing a clean plant program for the sustainability of the grapevine industry, uh, what type of pests we have, how they have been emerged, and how the onset of those uh, diseases, for example, or how they have emerged, we need to see that the, this, uh, this scenario as a whole uh, to build a, a, a sustainable clean plant program. Okay, um, that brings to uh, my outline of the presentation. So we will talk about graft transposable agent, agents. Uh, what I mean by graft transposable agents is the ones that are um, transmitted when you are grafting the plants. Uh, we'll go into the details of how, how many are there and what are their importance. And then uh, we'll talk about grapevine certification standards, how the typical structure looks like and how they are different from different countries. Um, what is the difference in terms of uh, how many pathogens they test, well, how, based on what they have stand, they have, um, uh, they have made these standards for their uh, regions, for example. And also we will talk about uh, about the Canadian perspective, what we have learned from other uh, uh, clean, clean plan programs, and uh, I will end up with some success stories. So as I said, uh, before developing any clean plan program, we need to see uh, a particular crop species uh, as a whole in terms of uh, in that particular region, how it is being grown. For example, uh, grape wines are unique in the sense, you know, um, in the areas like Ontario or British Columbia or Nova Scotia, they do uh, grow um, in the same spaces or adjacent where they have other fruit trees, whether it is grown, grown, grown home trees or stone fruits. 
uh, as I mentioned here, the numbers in the parentheses in this uh, um, in, in this graph uh, shows the number of viruses uh, they share. As you can see, grapevines are obviously very susceptible for a number of uh, viruses and virus-like agents, but they don't share that many with other crops. So a knowledge on this type of information is very much essential when you are developing clean plant program. You need to understand how many uh, pathogens or pests that are important for your crops, whether they have, they have any cross infections with other crops that you are growing in, in that area. So that would help us to uh, focus on you know, what type of diagnostic tools we need to develop to detect that particular pathogens or to come up with uh, 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 ideas of whether we want to include that particular pathogen in your program or not, uh, based on uh, how it is going to affect the crop in terms of the quality and productivity. So, as I mentioned, uh, the focus of this talk will be viruses, but I will be talking about other uh, pathogens as well. Um, you might have seen this slide uh, a lot of times about the major grapevine virus diseases that we, we have uh, here in Ontario as well as other grape growing regions. So how we uh, came across this particular uh, point, um, say we did a lot of surveys back in 2014 to 2017. We did large scale surveys in British Columbia about how many grapevine viruses we have because the earlier surveys were uh, backdated in 1995. After that, there's so much have been changed in terms of how we grow grapes, what type of varieties that we grow, um, from hybrids to vinifera. Um, there's so many changes that happen. So that means we have imported or distributed the planting material in a wide scale. That what what does that mean? That means uh, by knowingly or unknowingly, we have distributed uh, pests and pathogens as well. So what does that bring now? So that's why large scale uh, surveys are important. Uh, as we did uh, large scale surveys in BC with, uh, with collaboration uh, with Dr. Hussey Ramon and Tom Lowry um, in uh, AFC Summerland, uh, as well as uh, from the last three to four years, uh, uh, Dr. Wendy McFadden Smith has been doing uh, large scale surveys in collaboration with the Covey. Um, we do found that of, uh, to summarize all this, uh, the research point, I'm sure Wendy will be talking more in, in details in, in the next uh, coming uh, uh, the lecture on the virus diseases. But what we know that um, grapevine leaf roll disease and grapevine red loss disease are the most widespread virus diseases so far. We do have other other virus diseases, um, but not as uh, when you, uh, in, in comparison with the grapevine leaf roll associated virus 3 and grapevine red blast virus. So why? The question is, why the clean plant program? I know uh, as a researcher, when we talk about, uh, about the ecology or epidemiology of an, an emerging virus disease, uh, on how it is, uh, what is the, what is its incidence in, in a particular region, or what is this, uh, uh, the vectors, how it is spreading in the vineyards. Um, this, with, in my experience, uh, sometimes resonates not very well with the growers, but especially when it comes to connect the clean plant programs and, the, and its usefulness and, and its importance with the grape and wine industry, um, we need numbers. We need numbers in terms of uh, how how much damage that we can see in the short term as well as long term. Unfortunately, because of the size of our industry and you know we are here as a small industry when you compare to the um, our neighbors in the in, 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 in the United States of America, a lot of these studies came from the states. Um, <clears throat> as an example, I would say a leaf roll disease. Uh, an estimate that is came in 2012 is about up to $91,662 per acre over the lifespan of India. The, the similar studies on red blotch in 2015 and 2017 um, estimated close to uh, uh, $1,110 per acre per year in Napa County. Um, why these numbers are so fluctuating? Because um, these losses depends on so many factors, like what is the disease prevalence, what type of virus it is, what is the onset of disease. 
and what type of yield reductions they cause and how the grapes are being sold in that particular place, what's the price penalties when you have this uh, fruit that is infected with, with the virus um, and with the low quality. And also grape growing region, because um, say for example, probably uh, the rates of these grapes are not same as what we have here in Ontario when you come back to California, or Napa County especially, even in California, at each country, each county, based on their importance, their soil profile, their area, uh, the, the the rate of the grapes varies uh, considerably. And also, I would like to point out a fact that these studies, as you can see, back in 2012 to 2017, that is pre-pandemic. So we need to also consider um, post-pandemic. What is the inflation rates? The production costs have been rise, so we need to uh, reflect those numbers as well because uh, that's very important since we don't have direct economic studies coming out of this place. Uh, ho hopefully, we'll do some economic studies in the coming years. So we've been talking about the grades, but also when you see um, these clean plan programs, for example, in California, they do test for a disease called Pierce disease, uh, which um, they estimated uh, the economic losses are close to $92 million in California alone. Um, just to give you a background, this Pierce disease is caused by a bacteria um, called Zylella uh, fastidio, fastidiosa, and uh, the vector for this particular disease is uh, uh, a, a black, a glossy winged sharpshooter. Uh, Fortunately, we don't have that here um, because they they uh, <clears throat> the kind of estimated uh, uh, understanding is that uh, uh, the vector cannot survive here uh, with, with our cold conditions, which is good good news for us. Um, again, another um, um, disease called little, little cherry disease um, in especially uh, small fruits, uh, especially in cherry and other fruits, uh, has been estimated. In 2020 alone, uh, in Pacific Northwest, uh, the, the whole production is reduced by 12%. Again, this particular disease is called uh, is caused by two particular pathogens. One is a little cherry virus 2, and another is a, a phytoplasma, uh, which causes the uh, disease called the X disease of uh, little cherries. Um, you, you can see all these different crops with different viruses and different diseases also uh, uh, causing a huge losses to, to, the, to the production. Um, another example would be uh, I just uh, received a couple of calls from the cannabis and hemp industry uh, a couple of weeks back and saying that you know their, their production uh, values are coming down, uh, rates are coming down because of the a viroid called Hopstan related, related viroid. So when I looked up, because I don't really focus on how on the cannabis research, when I looked up what, what is this uh, um, viroid and what it is causing, I found out that in the last couple of years in California alone, the whole production of uh, hop, hop and cannabis industry came down by 30% just for one particular viroid. So they are focusing on their clean plan program for cannabis and hops. Uh, and, uh, and they are putting a lot of efforts in bringing this into full scale. So you can imagine the importance of clean plan programs. Then again, to, um, uh, to emphasize the fact that um, when we talk about the specialty crops, uh, specialty crops in the sense uh, we have fruit crops, we have berries, um, we have grapes, uh, we have uh, roses, uh, we have sweet potatoes, uh, potatoes, all these clonally propagated plants are <clears throat> affected in one way or other by graft transmissible disease. When I say graft transmissible disease, uh, it could be viruses, viroids, bacteria, and phytoplasmas. So all these, as you see in this uh, graph here, um, if it is graft, uh, grafted um, uh, material, uh, especially all the specialty crops that I mentioned are uh, using the grafted material, which means that we have a rootstock and the cyan material. The rootstock is typically uh, known to uh, provide some kind of resistance to pests and diseases, as well as uh, uh, in, in terms of the grapes, it, it also uh, helps to 
maintain the vigor of the cyan material as well as you know um, adjustment to the soil profile, uh, things like that. Uh, we have developed so many root stocks that that can provide additional benefits. Uh, but when it comes to the viruses, um, unfortunately, there is no root stock that can give you such type of resistance or tolerance. Uh, that's why I wanted to emphasize all these graft transmissible disease. Um, uh, um, graft transmissible agents are known to transfer between an infected rootstock to cyan, an infected cyan or healthy cyan or healthy infected cyan to uh, a healthy rootstock if you have used such material. And obviously, when you do, we don't do much of the uh, bone rooted um, grape points. Uh, um, we don't plant it that much, but ex except in some places in Nova Scotia. Uh, but if you have taken uh, cuttings from virus infected mother wine, obviously the, the Dorado wines have the, the virus. So, <clears throat> With that, I would like to uh, start how a typical uh, clean plant program looks like. Um, what are the factors that we need to take and uh, how? what are the different stages? I do have uh, graphics to explain all these points, so if you are uh, not willing to focus too much on the text, bear with me, but just to explain, um, first is the selection of varieties and rootstocks. Um, Say, for example, if we have a, a clone or variety uh, that is unique and um, you don't know the health status of that particular rootstocks or uh, sand material and you want it to uh, bring that into a large scale production by propagation, um, well, first thing that you monitor that particular plant to for any type of uh, indications or signs that, that have any symptoms and that, that looks like uh, a virus disease or other, other pests. Um, and then uh, if you have an affordability, you either do a, a serological, which is protein-based, uh, and molecular tests, which are mostly nucleic acid-based tests for the, those particular pathogens. And then again, how many tests, um, how many pathogens will all depend on how you are looking, uh, which crop you are looking, what, what is the region, uh, and what type of viruses that are prevalent in that country, or you also go to see uh, what is the, the quarantine regulation say about uh, um, for that particular country, for that particular crop. So there's so many different aspects that you need to consider when you are deciding which crop, which, which, which test that you need, to, you need to do. So if something that tests positive for, for, for a pathogen that is listed in your certification program, you obviously go through uh, a process called elimination, pathogen elimination, or virus elimination process. We'll talk about that very in detail. Um, but <clears throat> the second step is the production of nuclear stock. So this is the stock that you will be developing after selecting your um, <coughs> clones or varieties that you want it to be um, in, in, in your uh, germplasm collection or nuclear stocks. Um, usually these stocks are pretty much isolated. All the clean plant programs develops their own standards in terms of integrated pest management strategies, how they should be stored, which conditions they should be stored, what type of process needs to be there to track each clone, uh, and, and also um, whether you are doing a true to tightness to check the, the, the genetic stability of those particular clone or variety. So all these things are in consider consideration. We'll go through those steps in detail in the coming slides. And also, when it comes to the maintenance of the new nuclear stocks, then again, um, there will be protocols for regular monitoring as well as testing so that you know you are 100% uh, sure that you are, whatever you are maintaining your nuclear, st nuclear stock are being tested and also being maintained at the best, using the best management practices developed by uh, federal, regional, provincial, as well as their own certification standards that are being developed. And then the propagation block. So, which is the, the, the cuttings that you took from the nuclear stocks and maintained in another uh, block, which is called the propagation blocks. And the per very particular thing about this propagation block, we'll be discussing this in detail as well, is this material should only come from the nuclear stock. 
and also they do have a, a set of standards, usually set by certification uh, agencies, um, that we need to be maintained with uh, best management practices, um, and, and also there will be monitoring as well as regular testing. And then the finally certified plans, um, where either we have drafted or own rooted, and then even in the, so those certified plans, um, these are the plans that goes into the ground of you know broad fields or commercial fields. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about this in detail. So, say you I, you identified a, a sand uh, uh, variety and the rootstock varieties, and then in your certification standards you have say X number of uh, pathogens that you want to test, and you test it with the standard methods that are available, and it's all tested negative. So that means it's a candidate material to go into the uh, <coughs> certification program. So that, in, that refers to both cyan as well as rootstocks, and what we typically call it as a nuclear stocks. When you grow them, and then it will, the nuclear stocks, when you propagate from that, becomes the propagation, propagation stock, and then when we graft it, the grafted certified stock will have a, a certified rootstock cutting as well as certified cyan cutting. That's what we call certified stock. So that's very important. And also we need to make sure all these, um, either the certified rootstock cuttings and certified cyan cuttings are coming from the nuclear stock of the certification agencies where nuclear stock is there. It is very important to emphasize that this material should not be exchanged between the nurseries because once it goes out of the nuclear stock of the certification agency, it loses its status. That's what uh, many times uh, people have learned their mistakes by doing this and by uh, causing a lot of uh, uh, contaminated material to spread to different parts. Okay, so we took that in the scenario. Okay, you have identified uh, cyan and rootstock varieties, and it did test positive for one of the or one or more of the pathogens that, that are there in your certification uh, list. So <clears throat> we do have a process called virus elimination, which is typically uh, meristem tip tissue culture, where uh, you try to um, exercise. Um, the tip of the meristem that is 0.1 to 0.5 uh, millimeter in size, and by establishing those vines in an artificial media, trying to grow them into a, 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 a bigger plant, and then bring those material into the root uh, uh, nuclear stock. And then you test them again to make sure that all the pathogens in your list in the certification are tested negative, and that's where it comes to the nuclear stock. And then this procedure follows the same. You have propagation stock and you have certified root stocks. Now certified uh, both root stocks as well as sand cuttings. So to simplify this, uh, I know there's a lot of text I acknowledge that, but I'll uh, make sure it is simple for you. Uh, typically what we call the G1 is the, uh, is the mother wines or the nuclear stocks where you have screened for all known pathogens, either you test, by testing or biological indexing, which means uh, you take uh, an infected um, material uh, and then, you know, or the subject of the, the test, and then uh, graph them onto a healthy, uh, graph them with a healthy cyan material, try to see if the pathogen, if it is there, if it moves and expresses the symptoms, which typically for a perennial crop like grapes takes a lot of time. Uh, we do use um, varieties like Caffron, uh, Merlot as an indicator plant because they try to express the uh, symptoms of these viruses and viroids better than in some other varieties. Uh, and also test, uh, testing will involve a lot of diagnostic method. We're going to go uh, in detail uh, on those. Uh, and then as I said, uh, this, typically these foundation of nuclear blocks are maintained at the clean plant centers. Um, uh, I do have examples of clean plant centers where they are maintained in, 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 in the States or here in, in Canada. Uh, we will talk about that. And <clears throat> these um, mother stocks or nuclear stocks are regularly tested and monitored. They do have a program where um, uh, over a period of time they will test 100% of the, the mother block and, uh, you know, 
number of tests that they do uh, on a regular basis, things like that. And then um, this is the sole source of G2 material for nursery stores or certification programs. This is where, where it is very important to maintain because um, if you lose at this particular stage, then you know, it, it becomes very difficult to maintain the clean plant program. This should be the sole source, sole source of uh, G2 planting material, say for example a nursery or a grower uh, or a, a commercial propagator, they want to maintain their own G2. All the materials should go from this particular block. That's very important so that they don't exchange material between them after uh, sourcing G1 material from the certification areas. So again, uh, this will become, uh, you know, the purpose to increase this production of the wines is the wines to sup support the supply chain. Uh, typically, um, if the industry like California, Oregon, or Washington State, they might have to go for G3 and G4 blocks. Uh, but if the industry is small, is the demand is less, uh, you can still maintain this G2 as a certified block. Uh, but the more stages you go, the more process will be involved, uh, the more monitoring will be involved, the more cost will be involved. But the advantage of going to different stages of generation, G means generation, is you will have uh, more um, more number of wines in terms of production. You can you can have more number of wines to to uh, to distribute from the certified material. So that brings us to, okay, we know now how the certification looks like. Um, um, that's, uh, let's see how it looks like in different, different countries. Um, why I put this slide, uh, EPPO, which stands for European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Agency, uh, which kind of oversees the certification standards in Europe. Um, why it is important for us? Um, because we do import a lot of planting material, um, from Europe, especially two countries, France and uh, Germany, uh, mostly from France. And more recently, we are importing from the United States as well. Uh, so when you look at their certification standard, um, and again, when I say it's controlled uh, or overseen by this TPPO, you see the, the oops, you see this uh, uh, highlighted area, this uh, amendment um, of this uh, standard was first approved in 1993 and revised in 2008. So it's, it's old, <laughs> it's outdated. And um, I tried to go today uh, or a couple of days and see if they have updated anything. So no, um, uh, that's why I could download it uh, on so and so day. Um, maybe they're working on it, but when you see, when you uh, see their type of standard and what type of viruses they do test for, you can easily understand how um, how how much was understanding uh, our understanding on grape point viruses in 2008, not just here in Canada, but in Europe. Um, so that that brings us to the question: Oh, um, what what type of updates that we need? Um, when you look closely into those guidelines, what type of tests they do, as I mentioned, um, you know, there are, are tests based on biological indexing, uh, ELISA-based testing, and molecular testing. Um, they do test for biological indexing, especially for the leaf roll and true post wood complex. Um, they do have a standard of having a minimum of three replicates, 68 graphs for each. But it's, it's a very good thing to have this, this such kind of thing. But when you look at the LSA testing, they say um, they only test for grapevine plant leaf and other NEPO viruses, which are uh, mostly transmitted by nematode vectors. Um, but when you look into our surveys, uh, we don't have much of these NEPO viruses. Uh, we do have a little bit of fan leaf virus, but not at the alarming rate. Uh, when we did our large scale surveys in BC, it was not even uh, close to 3%. Uh, and wherever we have seen it, uh, based on our monitoring, it was not spreading because we don't have the vector that, uh, that the nematode species that can transmit the fan leaf virus, which is Gifinema index. We do have a Gifinema americanum, but uh, that is not the vector for fan. So we have to ask ourselves whether, um, you know, um, whether the, the standard in Euro will fit to us or not. 
Um, and, and, and other things like referral uh, and BT viruses and FLEC, they have been testing. Mm, but in their certification standards, uh, although they mentioned that some, some of these NEPO viruses, including pan virus, they test with ELISA, which is a bit less sensitive than the molecular methods uh, called like PCR, uh, polymerase chain reaction. But I never found in their standard where they have uh, specifically mentioned that you know their method of uh, the standard method of testing is like PCR based. Uh, they it actually it is left to the um, the laboratories that that operate in that region whether they want to use an or PCR. Uh, it's, it's only recommended, uh, not as mandatory. So to look more into details of the EPBO guidelines. Um, uh, type of viruses that, that uh, they test. Um, yes, there are few viruses that are important to us, all the nephrol viruses, uh, uh, rugose wood complex, and some of the phytoplasmas. But surprisingly, I don't find the more important virus that what we have here is the grapevine red blotch virus. So other guidelines include uh, there is a heat treatment, uh, which is typically uh, in any um, elimination process, uh, we do subject uh, uh, the, the lignified canes to the heat treatment, uh, the temperatures were given there, which uh, mostly eliminate the, the fungal pathogens or some, some type of bacterial pathogens in, in them, uh, but not 100% effective on the viruses and viroids. Uh, and they do have the meristem tip tissue culture to eliminate uh, these viruses, which is typically what we use uh, in, in our standards as well. So why the meristem tip tissue culture? Just to give you a background, um, um, as you see in this diagram here, um, oops, I think almost, um, this is the meristem uh, on a typical tip uh, of, of a, a shoot of the plant. Um, typically, um, this area um, has no structural vascular bundle. That means um, the cells are not differentiated enough uh, so that it doesn't have room uh, for the virus to move into this area. Uh, and not just in the grapes, in many crops it has been proved uh, that the, the success of using meristem tip uh, as a source of material to generate uh, 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 daughter virus or propagate the uh, plants uh, in, in many other crops. So uh, we are just using uh, the same principle uh, in, in generating um, virus free or viroid free plants. So uh, this is uh, the images that are provided by Linzu here. Um, so you can see uh, when you zoom into, uh, uh, this is the tip of the plant, uh, when you put under the microscope and zoom into uh, close to 100 to 120x, this is what you see. Uh, and when you remove a lot of layers in between them, this is the tip of the minister. And this, the tip of this particular uh, portion has to be cut and placed on a, on a, a nutrient uh, media which, with, with the plant hormones in it so that it can slowly start growing. And then once it starts growing, it will take um, at least six to eight months to um, become a 12-inch plant where we use that as a source of uh, plant materials to test again for the possible viruses or viroids that are present. That's the typical um, um, the medicine tip tissue culture protocol. <clears throat> to just to emphasize how the, the whole uh, whole process works, uh, when you have virus infected uh, wine and you want to make sure that to, to eliminate all the uh, all the virus and virides in that particular plant, you exercise the, the medicine tissue culture and you propagate on, on an artificial media under controlled conditions and slowly uh, after you test them with the high throughput sequencing a little, little dip, deeper on the high throughput sequencing, what is this method of work, why you will use that, and then uh, you propagate in the greenhouse once it is tested negative uh, to make virus uh, free healthy as well as you test for true to tightness to make sure that it is genetically identical to the plant that we started with. So um, just to give an emphasis on high throughput sequencing, as I was mentioning, um, we have biological indexing or symptom-based methods, serological methods, uh, but more recently, uh, uh, because of the sensitivity, the PCR or quantitative PCR-based techniques have been uh, gaining attention and been becoming very common in, 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 in all the uh, 
either diagnostic processes or quarantine processes. And then more recently, we have this high throughput sequencing, uh, which is uh, even more sensitive and more comprehensive in the sense that uh, uh, with only one test, you can detect all known possible uh, viruses and viroids in, in a given test. Uh, although it is a bit expensive when you compare to the, the uh, standard PCR-based methods, but uh, because of its comprehensiveness, um, uh, it, is, it is more sensitive. Uh, uh, we, we, we try to improve this particular method and implement that in, in the clean plan programs. So just to give you uh, more details on how it works, um, if you have a, a plan that is suspected for a virus, or suspected for virus or a viroid or any other graft transmissible agents, um, so you want to include that particular uh, particular clone in, into the clean plan program, we have so many um, nucleic acid extraction methods. Um, to minimize what you don't need and maximize what you need in terms of so enhancing your capability to detect uh, viral uh, nucleic acids uh, here, especially uh, when you have a total RNA, you can either go for rival depletion because it can, um, the plant total RNA mostly contains 80, 80 to 84 percent of the ribo, uh, ribosomal RNA, which we don't need. Um, we are detecting, we are only looking for viruses. Um, we have other options called the small interfering RNAs where um, it is very specific to viruses uh, and also if you want to enrich the viral nucleic acids alone, um, we do have a method called using double standard RNA which is an intermediate of uh, uh, any plant virus replication uh, in a process. Uh, if we target the double standard RNA and try to extract only double standard RNA, that means you are, you are only concentrating on the viruses uh, or virus-like agents that you have in the given sample. So I'm not going into the details of the process, how it is done, um, because we focus on, uh, on, the, on the clean plan program. But typically what I would like to say here is uh, uh, we do work with uh, uh, Dr. Mike Rod at the CFIA on a, on a, on a Genome uh, Canada project where uh, our aim is to develop uh, this high throughput technologies um, to increase uh, its efficient, efficiency as well as its sensitivity and also to reduce the cost, um, especially in terms of uh, uh, how many samples you can uh, composite in a given sample so that you know you can reduce the cost, uh, as well as uh, how you're going to analyze the data, the large amount of sequence data that you will generate uh, when you are doing, when you are doing such a metagenomic type uh, detection method. Uh, so, uh, Mike, uh, uh, with the colleagues from uh, University of uh, Victoria, uh, Jung, Dr. Juki Jang, uh, they, they're developing this tool called WinTool, uh, where uh, once uh, it's been in the process of developing, um, we are using the uh, current version now, but it's helping us to um, fast track the data process. Um, so that it will reduce the time, uh, reduce the cost of the a technician, uh, so that you know we can increase our efficiency and overall uh, reduce the budget that, that takes uh, for a for a for a HDS test. So <clears throat> recently, this uh, high throughput sequencing te technique has been used uh, in other um, national national clean plan programs, especially in the, in the states. Uh, for example. Um, uh, the traditional way of detecting um, um, or going through the high uh, clean plan program, excuse me, is um, say for example, either in a national clean plan network in, in the states, um, where they test for more than 30 different pathogens uh, based on ELISA or, or, or DNA or PCR based technique. Um, even the Canadian Waypoint Certification Network, which I will explain uh, in detail in, in the coming slides, they do have this many pathogens to test in a given sample if it needs to be included in the in the clean plant program. So again, once it is tested positive, the traditional way is you do the meristem tip tissue culture. Uh, typically, takes a year, um, and then uh, also do the biological indexing. For that, it might take a couple of years because you know the symptoms to express on these indicator plants will take a lot of time. And then the retesting for all those 30 plus pathogens, it also takes like weeks to months. Um, so 
if that the same process, if you use the high throughput sequencing, which is more comprehensive, uh, um, you're only relying on virus elimination process if you test positive, which is one year, and then reduce the biological indexing and then the retesting process also from months to probably weeks because the testing with NGS would not take that much time uh, as compared to the traditional LS or PCR based methods. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through this because we already gone how the process works. I uh, just wanted to emphasize the difference between the traditional uh, different type of techniques using like LIS or PCR based techniques as when you compare to the high throughput sequencing. So the typical structure of the National Clean Plan program in the, in the United States of America, as I said, they do have, they, they keep on updating their protocol based on the research that are coming from the uh, different aspects of um, uh, different different aspects of the research uh, from the academic institutions as well as the private institutions. They, they keep that in mind to make sure that the, there isn't any emerging pathogen of health uh, that is um, a concern for economic concern for the particular uh, crop, they do uh, develop those diagnostic protocols uh, uh, after understanding how the pathogen uh, is uh, diverse, in, in diverse in the sense of like the genetic diversity and all. And then they develop this uh, uh, protocol, and what they call is the protocol 2010. Although the year says protocol 2010, doesn't mean that it was developed. Uh, or stopped developing in 2010. It was initiated in 2010, that's why it's called 2010. Uh, but it's keep on updating. Um, they do have uh, uh, different type of uh, tests that they use, 30 plus viruses, including the phytoplasma and the, the PS disease, the bacterial disease. Um, and they do also use the, recently they do have approved the high throughput sequencing technology to use uh, in, in, the, in this process. So typically, uh, as you see here, uh, FPS has a foundation of nuclear block, and then the nurseries uh, will take that material and uh, register with the FPS, and those blocks are called registered increase blocks, uh, and they're certified nursery planting from where they take the material and then if they want to weigh them, go to uh, the fruit production vineyards or you know, go to growers. Uh, that's how typically it works. And <clears throat> when it comes to Canada, uh, I'll talk about the Canadian Grapevine, um, uh, Canadian Grapevine Certification Network. But just before that, I want to emphasize on the fact that how we operate as, as a country, uh, CFIA, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, they regulates imports of the grapevine from foreign countries, uh, just as USDA, United States of Department of Agriculture does for America if something has to come uh, into the country, if it is a foreign material. And um, Canada allows the import of grapevine plant, uh, planting material to the certified, um, um, material certifier under the US certification program. Recently it's been recognized um, from uh, New York. Um, before it was only California, Oregon, Oregon and Washington State. And quite recently a couple of nurseries were certified in New York as well. Uh, other than the USA, uh, the majority of our planting materials comes from France, as I mentioned before, uh, a little bit from Germany, are the only two countries that are approved and are actually certified to export grapevine uh, material to Canada. So, um, what, 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 what we have learned so far. So, uh, we do have Canadian Grapevine Certification Network formed in 2017, uh, rolled into 2018. Um, so they do have long-term certification standards. So typically, as, as it uh, um, structures very close to what the NCPN uh, from the United States looks like, so there is a new varietal se uh, selection. Um, there is a list of pathogens that you need to test uh, based on whether they test positive or negative. Um, if they test positive, they will uh, uh, go through the virus elimination process. And then they test negative. It's, they go through the multiplication stage. They say that it's G1A, G2, G3, and G4. Let's see what are the viruses. Again, there's a lot of text in there, a lot of names in there. Uh, don't worry about reading them. I just wanted to emphasize that uh, um, these viruses or other uh, 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 
phytoplasmas as well as the crown gall bacterium. Uh, we listed them based on our knowledge, our understanding of what we have uh, in the Canadian vineyards, what we have been finding in recent years based on you know the large scale surveys that have been conducted. And what could be important? Say like uh, okay, uh, there are, we are importing mainly from. Uh, France, Germany, and, uh, and the United States. Uh, what are the big problems there? Uh, so um, the CGCN put a lot of effort in in coming into the list, in, in, in bringing this list into um, um, into the certification to make sure that you know you're not uh, going to have uh, some emerging disease in very near future, and also addressing uh, the viruses that we have concerns so far that are econ economically important. Uh, so, for example, to give you the crown gall bacteria, um, they, in, 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 uh, in the states, for example, they really, especially from California, they really don't test for it because it's not a problem for them. It's warm climate, the bacterium doesn't express, but uh, it's not the case here. I mean, we have that certified material coming here and exposed to the cold temperature through the uh, winter injuries or cold injuries. Uh, the bacterium express. So it's important for us to um, uh, give uh, the list of the pathogens that are concerned to us. So again, to emphasize um, what we are uh, at Kavi um, doing is, um, as I mentioned, that we have a, a, a Genome Canada project uh, working on developing uh, these high throughput sequencing technologies to implement, to, to bring into a, a stage where uh, we can um, we can use this technology in the clean plant program and also make sure that um, this particular technology can be universal. Uh, say like the, the method that they're, they're using in states or some other country would accept the, our method because we've been collaborating with them and make sure that you know we, we improve this method so that it, it has been it will be accepted universal. And then again, it's a, it's a pan collaboration network for this project. Uh, we have uh, collaborators from uh, academic institutions, um, at the regulatory agencies, uh, as well as uh, uh, the grape and wine uh, sector, uh, the CGCN. Um, so uh, we are working together to make sure that you know we develop this uh, high throughput sequencing technology to implement in the clean plan program. And also another aspect of this particular project is to um, to do a, a national survey based on the high throughput sequencing, which is a comprehensive method to to bring some policy changes in terms of what type of viruses that we regulate. Uh, so we give that information to the regulatory agencies, like CFIA, and they want to use that data to either make uh, some policy changes or, you know, regulate or deregulate some of the pathogens that we have or we don't have. So again, um, to to conclude, last a few couple of slides here. Um, Certification of uh, our clean plant program is work in progress. It's always you need to know, um, you know, uh, what type of you know, uh, what type of uh, pests and pathogens that you have. Uh, what are the changes that are happening elsewhere in different countries, um, and, and see what their certification standards looks like. Um, just to give an example, uh, you know, Australia and New Zealand, their standards uh, include robust system fitting. And, and the waypoint virus B. Uh, Rubus pitting virus is one of those viruses that are very ubiquitous, uh, that are present everywhere that we see here in Canada. And, um, and there is no surprise that actually the CGC and the Canadian Waypoint Certification Network uh, omits this particular virus and it allows the virus into the certification program. Um, so there are differences. We need to understand that those differences, why they are giving those emphasis on, on, on different regions. Um, say, for example, in South Africa, the, the viral diseases, no, they, they put emphasis on viral diseases than, uh, as, rather than the virus species um, and bacteria, humicities as well. <coughs> and then, uh, again, it is, uh, it is always important for us to, uh, you know, if you have a nuclear stock, a stock or foundation block, you revisit the health status of those we, we, uh, the foundation blocks. It's always important to keep updating ourselves in terms of new technology um, uh, that we have, uh, and, and also when and how we have to revise the standards of certification programs. 
uh, and it all leads a multidisciplinary effect uh, efforts here um, because um, different researchers with different particular areas, areas of expertise, they're working on different aspects. But when it comes to the clean plant programs, we need to understand these uh, pests and pathogens as a, as a comprehensive and you know, a holistic approach. And that's why we need to have uh, multidisciplinary efforts uh, in developing the, the clean plant programs. And then these are some of the questions that we'll be asking when you're developing uh, or when you are maintaining a clean plant uh, program. Um, what viruses are important? Um, any viruses that can be tolerated or eradicated in, in a given geographical location? And um, what type of methods are, are the what type of adaptations that you are taking uh, to um, uh, uh, bring in data diagnostic methods into your clean plant program? And how to ensure that you know uh, your certified clean material, propagating material is available uh, to the growers uh, or nurseries. Uh, uh, and also, uh, when, when I say uh, clean plant program is the first step, we we need a start start clean and stay clean programs. Uh, some of the success stories. Uh, 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 I'll just go through quickly here, um, just to give a couple of stories. And again, there is a lot of text here. I just wanted to summarize a couple of points. Uh, so one story of uh, uh, Tim Bell, which is a clone that found uh, in Croatia, um, uh, which is very unique. Uh, when they found it, and they wanted to bring it to the clean plant program at UC Davis. So when they tested, because they have very, uh, very limited availability of that particular clone, when they tested it, it was found positive for one of the viruses that is there in the certification programs. So <clears throat> they did uh, eliminate the virus in, in, the, in, the clean, in the virus elimination process and also shared that particular clone to uh, the, the host country, Croatia. And as a result, you know, the discovery or origin of Genfendal, which is uh, with many new Croatian cultivars have been developed into wines in Croatia. So the industry was uh, uh, was, was becoming very successful with, with, with this type of stories. And also, uh, to give a few more examples um, how it's been benefiting, especially the clean plant program in the States, um, uh, there is a study by uh, Fuller et al. in 2019 where um, they estimated having clean plant program for grape wines um, substantially exceeds the, the growers' cost to benefit ratio of, of close to 117 over 10 years. So that's, that's huge. Uh, uh, when you have such programs, you also need such uh, uh, studies to understand what is the benefit that is coming out of the programs. Uh, and another program that has, in 2020, by Chen et um, uh, in, in just California, the clean plant program for great points has an annual benefit of $70 million. Um, uh, uh, that, that's the kind of impact that uh, the clean plant program is creating. Uh, and then just before coming to this, uh, this presentation, and uh, this something is popped up on my Twitter, so I put it in here. So when you have a clean plant program, so this is the team of breed, the grape breeders um, that they have developed a quadrant milieu resistant uh, wines. Um, so once the, what typically they did is they developed these DNA markers um, that can actually define what type of disease resistance to the powdery mildew um, in these clones. So once they do that, that type of research, when they want to put it into public domain, they are sending this material to the clean plant program over at the UC Davis, where they take a look and they also test for other pathogens in the certification standards, and then they make sure that they make it available to the, the nurseries. That's the advantage of having clean plant program. I just thought that this is a, a, a nice way to go here. <clears throat> so just to give you a, a brief a summary of how United States operates, as you can see, all those dots uh, with the different colors or different uh, um, Different uh, uh, different crops, um, and then the ones that are cir cir uh, circular, uh, uh, circular in red, are where uh, the research centers are focusing on the economic benefits of this clean plant program. So uh, I think they started somewhere in 1994, 95. Now you see how they have spread over the years onto different crops, just not the grape vines. That's the importance of uh, of uh, uh, of clean plant program. Um, just to give a couple of um, 
examples here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, not on, uh, again, uh, when I say great points, everything is a great point, so I wanted to change and tell you something different. Um, so, uh, the sweet potato has a problem in California, uh, and sweet, sweet potato production, and they had, a, um, they had this, this, this particular disease that they're all suffering from, it's called Rosette crack, uh, uh, which is caused by a virus. Uh, <coughs> it's called the sweet potato feathery motile virus. Um, so their, their yields were low in 1967 uh, because of all these things that California was uh, looking at the five pounds per acre uh, in terms of production. Um, so they team up and they developed this clean plant program. And again, the Maristam Tip Tissue Culture along with the, the, the public-private research uh, investment on um, doing research on high yielding varieties, disease resistant varieties. As resulting in a significant increase uh, in two, 2001, they are looking at uh, you know double to the production has been doubled to 12 tons an acre. Um, so and then now you see uh, the clean plant program for sweet potatoes not only in California they extended it to Louisiana, North Carolina, and Mississippi. So again, I wanted to emphasize uh, um, the success of these clean plant programs. Uh, also heavily depends on how your education on the outreach program works. Uh, I think the NCPN are doing uh, great work with their outreach and the, uh, education programs in educating growers and telling them that the benefits of the clean plant programs. So with that, um, I mentioned this before, um, the clean plant program is the beginning, but it is a very big step. Uh, if you don't have clean plants, you cannot maintain the clean you know, wines or, or uh, clean wines. Um, <clears throat> with that, I'm, I, uh, since I have a couple of minutes, uh, this is just a PR for my lab. Um, we do have a virus testing lab. Um, we do work with the CGCN to um, uh, to help with the certification uh, program. Uh, that's Tony, uh, who does all the virus testing and. Uh, uh, this is Linzu. Uh, we do have a, a, pro a program, uh, a project called you know, developing micro shoot tip fish culture based protocols for maintaining virus free um, breakpoint germplasm, um, which is uh, complementary to the, the, the germplasm that the, the CDCN have at uh, uh, CFIA facility in Sandwich. Um, and again, it is uh, it is a part of a, um, a collaboration between um, the funding coming from Moji WRI, CTCN, as well as Brock University. <clears throat> and we do have bad guys, the virus testing, virus culture facility, where we use these virus cultures as, as the controls uh, for developing or uh, maintaining our uh, diagnostic protocols intact and also developing new uh, and efficient protocols uh, for virus testing. So with that, I um, um, have a lot of collaborators. Um, I would like to uh, thanks and the funding agencies. And uh, this is the team for, for now. And I think that's it. We have time for questions for Sid. I have a couple questions, Sid. Sure. Um, so you mentioned in Europe when you were looking up their testing uh, procedure their, for their clean plants that they're not testing for red blotch. And do you think you're not testing because it's not there, or do you think you're not testing because it just hasn't made it into their testing protocol yet? Uh, that's a quite interesting question. Um, see, it's not mandatory to test. Um, so obviously, if I'm a, 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 a grip waypoint propagator, large scale waypoint propagator, <coughs> say I would really avoid it uh, because it, it it brings too much uh, uh, money on my table. And the second thing is, uh, uh, I think there have not been uh, large scale surveys, uh, especially in the commercial vineyards, to look for these new uh, new viruses or virus diseases. Uh, uh, that's one of the uh, limiting factor, I think. Uh, if, if they test, I mean, uh, if they do test and found out that it is not there, it is actually good for everybody. Uh, but um, being confident that it has been tested and it is negative is more important than you know not being tested. <clears throat> now, um, just to follow up with that, even though 
you know, they may not be testing because the material is imported into Canada, what role does CFIA play in testing samples of material that come in from France using our protocols that would test for red blotch to confirm that it's not present? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, the question is uh, what uh, what does CFIA does when, especially when we are import, uh, importing the material. Um, CFIA as a regulatory uh, agency, their mandate is to test, uh, especially uh, for uh, pathogens that are regulated in, in Canada, but they do test for economically important like red blotch. Uh, but because uh, because of the, the amount of material that we import, uh, probably it is in, in millions uh, every year. Um, I, I'm sure it will be very very minute in terms of uh, how much we are testing. Um, that um, that may pick up, uh, but even if they find it, the red blotch, you know, they can say they can just uh, abandon that particular shipment and that particular lot. But it is not their mandate to say no to everything because it's it's not it's, it's not a regulated pathogen in Canada. It, it is not regulated; it is present. Uh, but <clears throat> I think they are very limited with the amount of uh, uh, amount of uh, or percentage of uh, you know material that being tested. Uh, obviously, there are so other other reasons for it. They are limited in their capacity, uh, and the the material that is coming in is. A huge in terms of what, what we're importing. Are there any other questions for Sue? No? Okay, well, please join me in, in thanking Sid for a great talk this afternoon. Oh, so, <laughs> and then uh, our lecture series will continue next week on March 15th with Dr. Jim Wilworth. He's an assistant professor in biological sciences here at Brock and also a covering researcher. And his presentation will focus on improving resiliency in grapevines to avoid freeze damage in a changing climate. So we hope to see you either in person or online next week. Thanks.